Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Let me go ahead and pull this up. Uh, All right. So I'm going to quickly introduce you while you're doing that. Okay, so Jessiana Seville is a registered licensed dietitian cur currently living in Florida. She graduated from Utah State University in 2006 with her bachelor's degree in dietetics from Marymount University in 2012 and with her master's in healthcare management. She began her career as a clinical dietitian in Baltimore, Maryland, where she worked for the renal floor and ICU as a nutrition support specialist. She currently runs a virtual practice providing nutrition therapy for people with CKD, which has a special focus on gut health. She is also the executive director and founder of the nonprofit Rena Line, which advocates for nutrition as a first line th treatment for CKD. She feels passionately about the role nutrition therapy plays in kidney disease to improve quality of life, reduce hospitalization, and slow progression to dialysis. You can follow her, and she loves new followers, at KidneyRD on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and Pinterest. So everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. You got to be vocal, right? Yes. Um, all right. So I guess I'll hand it over to you. Great. Okay. Thank you for letting me be here again. I'm sorry that I'm coming in just a little bit late. I had a few tech issues, which is like the name of the game nowadays, but I'm really excited to talk about one of my favorite topics which is of course, healing the gut, getting familiar a little bit with uh, the 5R protocol and what that means. Um, it's a, definitely a really important piece of kidney disease. I think whether you're in dialysis or chronic kidney disease, all of us as dietitians are encountering gut issues all the time. Um, and before I knew about the 5R protocol, I kind of pieced things together, but this really gave me some structure of how to think about a strategy and a treatment for people to give them uh, some help um, in a very systematic way. So I'm excited to share a little bit about that. My, uh, my journey into uh, gut health um, was not necessarily by choice. Uh, my sister, I'll tell you where this all started, uh, just as a quick pre-story, my sister called me probably, it was almost six years ago, and uh, she had like a really significant joint pain. I heard it was so painful. She'd come home and take a heavy duty painkiller every night because she just like her hands were so achy. She's a she's a dog groomer, and so she you know she's holding the leashes or whatever, and she's just so tired of it. So much pain in her life, and um, I had heard through a local you know dietitian group. We'd kind of gone through, and I'd heard a little bit about MRT Leap, and I was like, well, I guess you could try that. And uh, she didn't do it for a while. And then I needed to dive into, uh, I ended up having an opportunity come up where the LEAP therapist in our town was leaving and I was still growing my private practice. So I decided I'd certify there and she was my first client. And um, ever since then, uh, the gut has been a part of my practice. And, you know, just like the immune system, you just can never learn too much. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Oh. Uh, Megan, you've got to give me on the security settings screen sharing capacity. Um, so I can't, it's one of okay. those new Zoom updates. I will do that. Um, okay. You can, you try now? Okay. Okay, I'm going to move this out of the way. Um, Okay, so healing the gut, um, we're gonna talk about the 5R approach, kind of systematic, give you a little background about how the gut and the kidneys are connected. Um, so as an overview here, I wanna talk you through kind of the current literature behind it and then discuss some practical pieces you can use on a dietary or a lifestyle or kind of some supplement strategies to aid in gut health. Um, in the functional world, there's so much that you can do with this, but the reality is that uh, <laughs> if you're in a dialysis unit or a lot of places, you're not going to be doing heavy duty functional testing. People can't afford $150, $200 of supplements a month to heal their gut. So, but there are some things that we can do to at least help people start feeling better. So just, this is not me that loves the gut and kidneys. It is all over, it is plastered over the lid plastered all over the literature right now. You're gonna see a lot of information about it. Um, but this is from 
uh, Dr. Corey, a fairly recent study, uh, 2017, but he says more or less the gastrointestinal tract is a forgotten organ, organ in kidney disease and uremia. And it doesn't matter if someone is on hemodialysis or chronic kidney disease, obviously chronic kidney disease, especially we need to use this as an opportunity, but even if they're in hemodialysis, preserving what function they have makes a difference in their long-term outcomes and it makes a difference in how they feel and how they respond and the flexibility of their diet. So I do feel like this is a pretty critical piece. Um, so what you're gonna look at in the literature is they have what's called the kidney gut access, right? And it's this association between the gut and the kidneys um, and how they're intertwined. And a lot of this has to do with how the, the microbiota, um, some, how they're metabolizing uremic toxins and their byproducts and how those byproducts are becoming uremic toxins. So it's a very much a cycle. Um, hold on, one, I, uh, the baby monitor is in my office and I have a babysitter, but it's very noisy for you guys. I can imagine that's distracting. Let me just turn it down real quick. Okay, sorry. Um, there's nothing that will like take your brain out of mode faster than a baby crying. Um, so you have, you know, you have this uremia induced impairment and what uremia does to your intestinal barrier and that lining is really, really interesting. So it not only is going to impact the intestinal lining, which is part of your immune system. You know, we wonder why are people with kidney disease get sick so easily or even, you know, in the COVID crisis, why, is, why are the kidneys one of the things that's really getting attacked in this piece? It's partially because their immune systems are not as strong if they are having extra uremic toxins. So it's a really, really significant, uh, a really significant piece. Um, let's just see. Uh, Megan, if you can watch the chat and stop me if there's something I need to address, I would appreciate that. Yes, I'm, I'm handling it. <laughs> okay, okay, good. <laughs> I can't, the chat does, is not pulling up on my screen, but I, I just don't want to miss anything from anyone. Um, so here, this is my favorite graphic. If you've ever heard me speak on this topic, I use this graphic every single time because it is, number one, a great picture, and number two, it is just very, very clear on the cycle of how the kidneys are connected to the gut. And I, you really want to understand this if, uh, one, to explain to someone, you know, with kidney disease that maybe they don't even have gut symptoms, why you would be targeting that in the first place. But if it's someone in hemodialysis, you also want to know what is going on. How is their, how are their kidneys connected to their gut health? And why is it so important that we don't just breeze over when someone's like, ah, oh, you know, like, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I go to the bathroom every two to three days and that's pretty regular. You're like, that's not, that's actually not regular. It sounds like you're in a pattern, but that's not being regular. Um, so, you know, you have decreased kidney function. That's on top of that, you're going to start having more medications, more, co more comorbidities, uh, more constipation. Um, the diet can change for people. I think all of us know this, some of the classic recommendations, people are restricting fruits and vegetables. So decreased kidney function, you start having all these pieces come into place. Then you're gonna have decreased motility, decreased protein digestion, decreased um, absorption. And sometimes that can be from edema, which in dialysis is a, is a significant piece. Even this decreased protein digestion that was fairly significant, um, I'm going to talk about where it starts in the stomach and how we apply the 5R protocol, but this is important because uh, protein that is not broken down well, it ends up feeding proteolytic bacteria in our gut, which is bad. <laughs> um, if you are feeding the, the proteolytic bacteria flora, you are more or less nourishing opportunistic bacteria where their byproducts or the toxins that they produce as they eat and metabolize their food are um, they can they can be uremic toxins for one that's one of the places where you start seeing this tie is that you feed proteolytic bacteria and they're then they're producing things like ind indoles amines um the thios the paracresol any of those which are uremic toxins um so that's one part of it as well then when you have this toxin generation it's going to cause further mucosal injury in the gut 
you have some of this translocation of the bacterial toxins where it's getting across that gut barrier and now in the bloodstream, which is now impacting inflammation. Um, and the inflammation means you're getting cytokine release, inflammatory mediators, and you're having a raised inflammatory response. Um, and we all know that inflammation is playing a role in chronic kidney disease. And it's not all just because of kidney disease. Sometimes it's actually the gut and probably more, more likely the gut is the heavier player there. And then both of these are going to come back to increased cytokines, increased rheumic toxins, which means you have further decline in your kidneys and then the cycle starts all over again. So you can see why this is really important that we are intervening at any place in this cycle here. Um, how can we intervene here to, uh, to break this cycle and maybe give some support to the kidney function? Um, I'm gonna kind of slip through these because I wanna get to the, the kidney protocol, but you know, if you break down each of these pieces, that's this is actually what I already did. Um, I tend to get caught up in that slide. So the next piece that you kind of, you want to understand here is this intestinal permeability. The, the buzzword, the thing you hear in the literature is leaky gut. It, leaky gut is a true physiological phenomenon. It's not just a buzzy word used by influencers and social media. So our gut is meant to be a semi-permeable membrane. Um, actually, I need to pull my picture over here so you can see what I'm doing with my hands. Right, so it's meant to be a semi-permeable membrane. So our nutrients can pass through, vitamins and minerals can pass through, all of that. And um, for a host of reasons, that membrane can start getting bigger, you know, more permeable. So rather than it being a really tight, um, you know, sieve, it ends up being a a colander where things are just flowing through. Um, and you're going to start launching an immune response for it. In this picture, you can see here, here's a really tight um, intestinal, in, uh, a very tight um, uh, uh, mucosal barrier right here. Um, and we have, you know, both sides. So on this side, we have, you know, the villi. Here's all these things coming through our gut, whether they're pathogens or bacteria or whatever, and they're not going to get through. When this starts getting leaky or stretched out or, you know, whatever, you start getting these bigger holes, you're going to have things start pass through and our body's response is to launch an immune response, right? So the macrophages get in there, pro-inflammatory cytokines, etc. cetera. Um, the other thing that happens here is not just the pathogens that should not be getting through there do, but things that we shouldn't respond to, such as uh, the protein breakdown of food, we start responding to as well, which is where people start developing food sensitivities or um, allergies to certain things. So question here, who needs help with the gut health of our clients? And I more or less would say probably almost everybody, but um, this is how I kind of target this as a priority. Obviously everything's important, but you can't do everything at once. So if someone has, obviously if they have SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, you're going to target that. This is very infrequently tested, <laughs> but it is someone who definitely is gonna need to work on their gut and you do it differently than other things. If they have dysbiosis, or if they are complaining of some significant GI complaints, primarily I'm targeting if they are complaining of GI complaints, um, I want to know. And this includes from the top to the bottom, you know, are they having heartburn? Are they burping after their meals? Are they constipation, bloating, gas are kind of obvious, um, diarrhea as well. If there's any sort of excess gas production, whether it's on, on the top or the bottom, whether they're having gas or burping, that's a really big sign. And we kind of joke about it in our culture, um, but that is a sign of a not healthy gut. Um, I feel like also the people I really hone in on this with are people that are manifesting some sort of autoimmune response. Um, or, you know, when people are talking about unusual uh, health maladies um, on their skin, in their, you know, maybe their, their eyes or how they're feeling or fatigue or, you know, something that like, I just don't really know why. Um, that's another piece that I kind of hone in on where the gut might be involved. Um, in my personal practice, I will say, 
um, some of the clients that have been really successful is they've come in and they have an idiopathic diagnosis for kidney disease, meaning they don't, the doctors don't really know why. They did all the testing for autoimmune, they do all the testing for everything that they can think of, and they're like, we don't know why your kidneys are having a hard time, but they are. And we end up walking through a gut protocol with these people and um, it ends up being really effective. So to understand a five-hour protocol, you must understand the gut from top to bottom because you can't apply a five-hour protocol unless you understand this piece and have kind of a refresher on your anatomy and physiology and what's going on. Um, part of being a detective with the gut is figuring out where, you know, where the process is stopped and what's wrong. So digestion starts in our brain. When we smell, uh, when we smell foods or think about foods, right, our mouth starts watering. That's called your, cepho your cephalic response. And uh, that starts your whole digestive process. So take, having people take time to think about or anticipate their meals in a positive way can start their digestive process moving. Um, you know, there's, I, this is a really key piece. It's something in our society we miss out on because we use fast food, right? We drive up, we pick it up, and then we get going. They don't have always that experience of uh, cooking where, you know, you can smell the onion sauteing and then you have the rosemary and you really are getting this, you know, this very sensory experience from, from cooking that starts our digestive juices flowing. So that's the first part. If people are busy, I just advise them and work with them on starting their digestion by thinking about and, um, and being, you know, anticipating their meals so they can start the digestive process. Then obviously the mouth, there's chewing, but you do release enzymes there. And then it's gonna start signaling to the brain as you start chewing to start your digestive way down below. So your enzymes that are produced, your digestive enzymes, um, your gallbladder getting going, your liver, et cetera, um, your pancreas, all of those are kind of, uh, you know, you prime the pump with this cephalic response and also by starting to chew and enjoy your food. Uh, so people that are scarfing down their food really quick, not only do they have big chunks of food that have to get digested and are not broken down well in the mouth, but they haven't taken time to really get the digestive process going. Um, esophagus, you know, that's the slide. It gets it from top to bottom. The stomach is a really critical piece, probably one of the most important pieces in the 5R protocol that is easy to intervene with, but you're gonna have acid going in there for digestion. You have, you know, pepsin that's gonna help breaking down um, the proteins. Um, it's gonna be churning the food, breaking it down, and then it starts releasing the food gradually into our gut. Um, fat generally is last and carbohydrate is first. Then you have your small intestine, you have the villi, right? And the, the more surface area you have, the more um, you're going to be absorbing. I really like to think about people's history when I'm considering um, this small intestines because sometimes it can play into what's manifesting. Um, an example of that is <clears throat> I met with a lady recently and she has celiac disease and she's had celiac disease diagnosed for over 10 years, but her GI doc told her originally, well, you know, if you don't have any symptoms, don't worry about cutting out gluten. So she ate gluten for years and years and years and years and years. I mean, like, I was trying to like keep my jaw up while I'm talking to her because I just could not believe this. I was so sad. But um, the, you know, over time, those villi were getting flattened by the gluten and it really was probably manifesting in autoimmune response because she also had Hashimoto's and now is having kidney issues and, you know, a, a pre-diabetic even though she's, you know, very small and within a healthy weight and runs a healthy lifestyle. So I just, you know, that was a piece of it. Her villi was hampered by that celiac disease. Um, you also get the chyme that stomachs the trigger release of the bicarbonate ions, which brings your, your stomach to neutral. If you have poor acidity in your stomach from the beginning, you can see that's going to start impacting the rest of the flow from here because your chyme is not going to be as acidic that's released. Um, and you're not going to have the same release of enzymes. Plus, you know, you're, you're going to have things that slip through your stomach that shouldn't. 
Um, pancreas, enzymes and insulin, they help us break down and utilize foods, the gallbladder. Again, it stores bile from the, litter, the liver so we can emulsify fat. And then your colon, right? So much bacteria live here. This is a huge part of digestion and our immune system um, and a really, really significant piece. When you're thinking about probiotics, they are coming here to the colon, hopefully. You're ho hoping that's where they go, not the small intestine. So how are we gonna think about this? One is you wanna consider a root cause, right? This is kind of this first framework. You need to consider a root cause of why there's digestive issues um, and <clears throat> you know, dysbiosis, leaky gut, inflammation, food sensitivities, we'll talk about that in the remove step. And then how are we gonna control digestive symptoms so people can start feeling better um, in, uh, in a world where digestion and focusing on digestion is not a primary healthcare objective in the typical Western model, um, having people have good results quickly allows you to trust them. So I use Lindsay, Lindsay Zerker's example here a lot because it's such a great, great example. But in the dialysis unit, she would talk about, you know, maybe patients were not compliant with phosphorus or, you know, fluids or whatever. Um, but she would work with them on their gut health. They would see some positive changes. You know, maybe they were always bloated. She'd talk with them about why don't we just try papaya enzyme, something real simple. And they would see results. And after that point, they, they could see that she was a teammate. She was a cheerleader and a coach for them. And they could help. They, she, they'd be willing to work on some of the other issues. Um, but you want to control these digestive symptoms because you don't want further damage. You don't want further deficiencies. Um, and you want to kind of soothe that inflammation and start getting a, a, uh, a more positive trajectory. Then you're going to repair for the same reason. You've got to improve your digestion. You want to promote food tolerance. Um, people build, people having food intolerances, and you're going to want to kind of move in that direction um, and then prevent recurrence, which is where you are always looking at root cause so this doesn't happen again. If you address things superficially, you will get a superficial response, which means you're either always dependent on a supplement or a pill, um, or, <laughs> or the problem ends up getting bigger later on and you can't resolve it simply. Um, you know, you want to you want to promote that regular turnover of the gut. You want to strengthen your, your immune system and, and uh, maintain a stomach acid barrier. So here's how we walk through the 5R protocol. There is, you don't have to do this in order, but you do want to consider all of these pieces when you are um, walking through this. This was developed, originally a 4R protocol was developed by uh, Dr. Bland, Dr. Jeffrey Bland. He was a biochemist um, at uh, the University of Puget Sound. So that's linked with the Linus Pauling Institute. Uh, he was the director there. He's written a bajillion books and uh, a pretty sharp guy. This is used all over the place now. It's pretty prominent, especially in functional medicine. So you're going to want to remove things like trigger foods, pathogens, bacterial overgrowth, um, anything that is impacting that gut health. You need to remove the threat, remove what's bothering it, so you can get some great healing. You're gonna want to replace it, uh, replace anything that's deficient, which often, you know, if you've had micronutrient deficiencies for a while, you're not, producing the right enzymes. Um, you may have suppression of enzymes with PPIs or that sort of thing. So repl replacing enzymes, uh, maybe replacing fiber in the diet, getting, getting more of that back in there so you can nourish good bacteria. You're gonna repair your gut mucosal lining and uh, you're gonna wanna restore beneficial bacteria. Um, a lot of times in the gut health world, we kind of skip to this restore part where we're looking at just adding probiotics. And granted, probiotics can help repair a little bit. Um, and you know, if things right themselves, they can, you know, you can start seeing some replacal and you know, they might remove some certain bacteria, but this is not generally the, the number one place to start. It is at least a place though. And then stress management is huge. The connection between the gut and the, um, the, the connection between the gut and the brain and the gut and stress is very, very compelling. Um, 
I had actually three times this week, three people I talked to, <laughs> they said the trigger of their cascade of health issues, which included kidney disease, was a stressful period of time. Um, and I, I think that stress is just a really powerful piece to address. So removing, again, four places, foods, pathogen, toxins, opportunistic bacteria. So what does that mean? On the food side of things, this means either you're looking, you're looking at um, an elimination type diet or helping people find uh, maybe some common foods they might remove. I'm going to go through those in a second, some of the things that are common, maybe doing some very specific testing. I know that there's a lot of controversy around MRT testing, food sensitivity testing, um, and you know what the validity of it is in the science. Um, I can only say from experience and from working with a lot of practitioners, we find it a very useful tool. Um, and the science behind the theory of it and what's going on is, is really interesting. The immune response, it's all very based on understanding immune response. Um, common allergens are like gluten, dairy, eggs, yeast, corn, soy, citrus, nightshades, and nuts. Um, but a lot of people can find relief, again, depending on what it looks like removing just gluten and dairy can be a fairly significant piece for a lot of people. I find soy a lot, but I'm not going to say that's literature-based. I just might have an influx of clients recently that have problems with soy. Um, pathogens can be a variety of things. It's really hard to target pathogen removal without testing. Um, sometimes, you can, uh, sometimes you can guess based on somebody's history um, you know, uh, if they might have had exposure to a certain pathogen, uh, maybe they were overseas and they got food poisoning and then ever since then their gut has just not been quite right. That's probably a trigger point in your mind that there's something going on there. A, uh, at least for myself, I advise my patients that we're going to test because then we know for sure um, on these pathogens. Um, H. pylori is fairly prominent. A lot of people have it and it is linked to kidney disease as well. So it's something that I look for. It, it impacts the stomach and the stomach acid and really the whole flow of digestion from there on. So I use some, um, I use diagnostic solutions or GI map to test for any of those, but there's several different stool tests you can use if that's part of your practice. It's not practical in dialysis <clears throat> unless you have a very, um, a very uh, progressive, team and doctor that's willing to try that or a patient that has uh, you know significant funds and really wants to do a deep dive. Toxins can be another piece. It's a thought why there might be issues with guts. Oh I'm sorry let me go back. Um, but toxins can be a piece whether that is um, the you know the chemicals that we're exposed to on a daily basis, um, the um, on our food, being able to wash our food, make sure that there's, there's not a lot of chemicals there is, as well could be a, a really significant pace, piece. And then opportunistic bacteria. Again, if you know someone has C. diff, getting a probiotic on board can be really helpful. Um, you know they have an opportunistic bacteria that's impacting digestion and they've got to get rid of that. Sometimes you really need those antibiotics um, or antifungals if there's a potential for candida overgrowth to kind of knock that stuff out really quick, but always should be in consideration for the long-term health. And often you need to combine that with, um, a, with a probiotic. One thing that I want to mention here on, um, on adverse food reactions, just to make sure people have a really good understanding of food sensitivities, allergies, that sort of thing, um, and I, I did pull this, uh, Erica Jolson is a dietitian that works in the functional world. And I like how this, this, how she lays this out, how she organizes it. Um, and that's why I'm pulling this from here. Um, you could find this same stuff in all of the medical literature. I just think her, her, um, her chart is really concise. Um, so you have immune mediated reactions, which are like food allergies or food sensitivities, right? Food allergies or IgE reactions. It's when people say, hey, like I eat, you know, I eat peanut butter and I can't eat any nuts because I have a significant reaction, a life-threatening reaction in some cases, you know, swelling, hives, trouble breathing. That's a, a food allergy. Then you have food sensitivities. These are non-IgA mediated. 
Um, and this is where our body is releasing a, um, our body is releasing a reaction to, um, uh, to foods. When I was talking about that leaky gut, that's what's going on there. Then on this side, you have non-immune mediated. So we have food intolerances like having a lack of enzymes. So if you, uh, one example would be lactose. Um, if, if you don't produce lactase, you're not going to tolerate milk. Um, so those are just a couple things. Home office. My daughter brought me a cupcake, which is really nice for her. Um, so here's what people are doing. When you're on removing this, you can either test and get something real specific, or you can do an elimination diet, right? So this might be a paleo diet, this might be a plant-based diet, might be an anti-inflammatory diet. You know, there's a lot, an AIP diet is very common. There's a lot of elimination diets that people can do. Um, and that they're trying. You, you can eliminate common foods and see how people feel. I think if people have a lot of uh, gut symptoms, it's reasonable to consider uh, removing dairy and removing wheat at least because of how they interact with the gut. And just see how they feel. Say, why don't you try it for two weeks and let's see how you feel. And if you feel better, then you know that's a good start. The other thing that I, you know, that I'll talk with people about, and again, I know this is a controversial issue. Um, the articles that we have listed have a great perspective on it. Um, so, but glyphosate is a herbicide that's used all over the United States. There is some thought that maybe gluten isn't the problem for some people with their gut. It's actually glyphosate. And, um, and, and that might be kind of this, core issue of the gut permeability or the core issue why people don't tolerate wheat especially well. Uh, there are many anecdotal reports and I can say this for myself personally, <clears throat> people go overseas and they eat, um, they eat, you know, the wheat there in Europe or whatever where they don't use these herbicides the glyphosates and they can eat all they want whereas they can eat none in the U.S. and they notice they can very different uh, experience here. I will say <laughs> that uh, for myself, I experienced this firsthand when I was sampling the Flavis products. Um, Megan doesn't know I'm telling this story, but um, I had, you know, Megan has sent me some Flavis products to sample um, for my patients. And so we were using them in my kitchen. And typically when I eat wheat, I get uh, really brain foggy and I'll get super tired. It's like almost an immediate response. It's really interesting to me. Um, I need to go take a nap. And I was like, man, like, you know, like it is bread and I should be getting a little brain foggy and I'm not like what, you know, what's going on with that. And then I was like, where do you guys process your bread products at? Like, what, what is this coming from? And I think, honestly, for me, it ends up being an issue with glyphosates because I've tried some other European grains and I haven't had any issues with them. This is some, and I, again, that's totally anecdotal. There is some studies on the glyphosates and gut permeability, but for people that are not willing to go gluten-free, or maybe they don't notice that they feel a lot better with gluten-free, then it might, it's, a possibility to go grain free and see if they feel better that way. And then if so, then have them introduce maybe some European grains and see how they feel. One thing that is nice about the Flavis products is they are manufactured from Italy and they use that Italian grain so they don't have this in it, which is kind of a big bonus in my mind. Um, then we go in the five arc protocol, we're gonna go to replace, right? You need to replace nutrients. If people have had really poor gut health for a while, they have not been absorbing um, nutrients well. So they could eat the best, most well-rounded diet, and they may not absorb almost anything. Um, the other thing you may need to replace is digestive enzymes. This is so simple for people that are just complaining of that kind of bloating after their meals or kind of always ongoing a little bit of bloating. If they don't feel better by removing dairy or gluten, then adding a digestive enzyme, something really simple can be helpful. Sometimes I like to target and ask them 
when they notice that bloating. So is it, you know, after you eat like an apple, like something real simple, or is it mostly after bigger meals? When do you notice that? And it helps me start thinking through where the digestion process is happening and what might be um, an enzymatic deficiency there. So if they say, oh, you know, like I eat apples and it's totally fine, I don't notice anything, then I'm like, hmm, okay. But if I eat a fatty meal, um, then I'm, I'm noticing that I'm getting more bloated then, then uh, that gives me some idea of what I might want to use. So if it's fatty meals, I'm gonna make sure that there's um, a digestive enzyme that maybe has some bile acids in it. Um, and if it's, you know, they notice more with like high protein meals and I'm, I'm going to include, uh, you know, protease and pancreatic acids and hydrochloric acid with breaking that down. If it's everything, then I'm gonna do kind of a broad spectrum one. Um, but they don't have to be expensive. Something like a papaya enzyme, which is really simple. Again, it's like less than, what, five, six dollars at the grocery store for probably more than a 60 to 90 day supply. Something to try and just see if it works. It's not going to hurt and it might help uh, for someone that's complaining of kind of that bloating discomfort in their gut all the time. Um, replace prebiotic fibers uh, from foods and supplements. There's a lot of products out there that are really great. Uh, sun fiber is a nice uh, product. Um, I generally will use kind of a broad spectrum, you know, a lot of different fibers, rotate them, different bacteria like different fibers and different foods. So if people are not eating a robust, varied diet, then changing up the fibers in a prebiotic can be really helpful. Sometimes use a powder, sometimes I'll use a capsule. The problem with capsules is they have to take more of them versus just a scoop of powder. Um, but this is a kind of a key place for me. The other thing is that if you suspect some nutrient deficiencies and you can tie them back into their history, um, and you know, you're kind of, again, thinking through the pathway. If they have a lot of um, uh, upper GI problems, they're complaining about burping or heartburn, you might be guessing that they have a lower stomach acid and then you know that they might be having a lower B12 level, which means they also might not be absorbing very many minerals. And so repleting those minerals would be important. So zinc, I think we see zinc deficiencies uh, maybe more commonly in a dialysis setting, people will talk about their hair falling out or their nails being really brittle and being able to replete that. One thing to know about zinc, zinc carnosine is, uh, there's a lot of different forms of zinc. Zinc carnosine is one that you can use to help uh, heal that gut barrier, but zinc competes with copper, so you wouldn't want people to stay on zinc for forever and ever and ever and ever. Um, because it's going to compete with copper absorption and create a copper deficiency. So again, pre prebiotics, I'm going to leave this slide on here. This is just kind of a very um, broad, you know, a couple different items here, the FOS, the inulin, general prebiotics, and then some food sources out there. I like to help people introduce new food sources. Jicama is a great one if you're on dialysis or not. It's crunchy. It's an alternative to carrots. It's got some really good prebiotic fiber in it garlic and leeks and uh, these foods people just need to try them once or find that they're already eating them and they just need to eat a little bit more of them. Um, artichoke, onion, people usually like them telling them they can eat more um, onion and uh, garlic. I know someone has a question about FODMAPs with onion and garlic but I'll get to that in a little bit and then you know again these are some more prebiotic foods. Just another chart. I keep this one in my office because it helps me kind of refer back to and not help me not get stuck in a rut of food recommendations and we're always expanding and diversifying the diet. So repair foods. Again, I'm going to say repair. This may be controversial. I know that there's controversy about bone broth. I, I know that. So if you were having qualms about this, then I think it's valid to read both sides of the research. One thing when it's looking at maybe some uh, uh, simple methods to improve the gut is maybe there isn't a bajillion, a double blind, you know, placebo controlled trial, but if it's not going to hurt them and it might help them, then if you can set a time period for that trial and see how it goes, you might as well try including some of these things 
um, and you know, see how it goes. So I know bone broth can be controversial, but there, the theory is that you know some of the collagen or gelatin can help heal that intestinal lining. If you're a dialysis patient, this would be an especially great place to see how you know see if this would work. If you're pre-dialysis and you're worried about you know some of the protein and bone broth and that sort of thing, I think you're just going to balance it in a full plan. I don't use bone broth with my CKD patients as a first line probably ever. We would <laughs> do some other things first, but for dialysis patients, this could be a really great place. Um, learning how to make your own is a good idea. It's to get a good quality one. It's fairly costly, but it's not hard to make good bone broth. You get the marrow bones um, from your butcher and you roast them in the oven and then you boil them with um, you know, a little bit of vinegar and some uh, herbs if you want to. Um, and then healthy fats, I think are great. Avocado, that sort of things are really, really nice. And fiber, 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 fiber helps what happens when the bacteria eat the fiber is the byproducts are going to help heal that intestinal barrier. If it's a, if it's a good bacteria, they can produce good byproducts, um, which is going to help heal that gut bacteria. That's why the prebiotics can be really powerful. The other things on this repair site is there is a wide variety of supplements to use in a repair um, step. Um, I typically will use zinc carnosine, melatonin, actually what we think of it for sleep, it has some gut healing properties and is great for CKD and dialysis. There's actually some really interesting studies on that. Um, you know, quercetin, vitamin D, omega-3s, curcumin, ginger, all of these are pretty solid. There is some possible maybe caution with uh, the licorice um, supplements and how they impact your blood pressure. Um, and then L-glutamine, I don't use this for CKD patients, but in a dialysis setting, this potentially could be a really great uh, supplement to use. One of the things about all these supplements, though, is that just taking a supplement is not going to solve the problem. You still want to think about it methodically in a protocol. So if someone is complaining of uh, gut issues of whatever type, um, being able to think through, okay, what's our first step? And number one, what's the root cause? What maybe do we need to remove in this case? And that's where you might try some simple dietary strategies, gluten or dairy. And then, um, you know, thinking about the upper GI tract, Maybe you try a little bit of apple cider vinegar or lemon juice to kind of stimulate stomach acid, see what the plan is for getting people off of PPI. Um, if they've been on it for a long time, then you decrease it slowly. You never do just a, a full on stop. Um, then you're gonna wanna think through that. This repair piece, you can proactively add some things in like melatonin, B5, E, vitamin D, but I, I generally like to use it in a, um, a protocol of, you know, where we've removed things and then we're trying to repair the gut at the same time. The other thing is you want to make sure you get a really good therapeutic dose. Um, in, the, in the case of supplements, a too small of a dose generally is not always better than none. Um, it can be equivalent to none in some cases because you don't get any response. Um, uh, last thing, beneficial bacteria, probiotics. Uh, one of the most common questions you get are what probiotics do you recommend? It is very much geared toward what the situation is and what they're dealing with on a very broad spectrum basis of like cultural. It's available in the store. Um, if people have more financial resources, I like Megaspore. Um, that's a really good product as well. It's a spore-based probiotic. Otherwise, if it's a con specific condition, I'll get on um, the, I'll either use Probiotic Advisor or the American, oh, man, Lindsay and I were talking about this. What is it called? I have it at the end, but the American Probiotic Advisory Board, and they have a list of the probiotics and kind of what those probiotics, like what uh, diagnoses those probiotics have been studied with, because there's some probiotics that are fantastic for eczema, for example, or Renadil is one that specifically has been studied and is targeted toward neuromic toxins. So just all probiotics are not equal, but having a probiotic can often be a good step for people. Um, you can, you know, long-term, I always like to have an exit plan for things. So probiotic foods, you know, 
can you teach people to ferment foods? Can you include some yogurt in their diet? How could that fit in their diet? Uh, kefir, sauerkraut, no, that sort of thing. We like to ferment vegetables at our house. Um, I like that flavor, some people don't. Um, you know, miso, tempeh, kimchi, natto, buttermilk. Some of these can be quite salty, um, but one thing is that the, pr the probiotic dose in a fermented food is in, you know, it's in the trillions, the number of bacteria in a very small amount. So even if you're using it as a small condiment, you know, a, a little bit of kimchi in a, uh, in a dish, pretty powerful stuff. So you don't use a lot anyways, or a little bit of sauerkraut on, you know, whatever you're having on, like have it on a taco, which I know is probably weird, but that's what we like, um, is a lot. Some of the pros of these foods is obviously they have a lot of, of um, organisms in them in the trillions versus the billions in a supplement. Um, not as much pill burden, et cetera, but some people don't like them. They're unappealing. You know, some people think that they're not helpful because they're fermented foods, but I think, I think that there's a lot of reasons to start incorporating them in the diet, firstly, but there are some possible cons if you don't know how to ferment things correctly. Can you introduce pathogens for foodborne illness? Maybe. Um, the other thing is on choosing a probiotic, I already mentioned this, but you're gonna really consider your individual symptoms and their health history. And then if people have a really terrible response to them, uh, they may have a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So if you try a probiotic and their symptoms go way up, especially bloating or gas, um, then you, they might need to get worked up for SIBO and follow a protocol for that, especially. It is a, um, it is really a bugger to kick out, but people feel better when they do. Um, the other place you can go, Natural Medicine da Database, if you have a subscription or membership with, um, the RPG practice groups, they have some really great, uh, resources there as far as evaluating probiotics. Um, and then most of the supplement companies have some really good information on the probiotics and why you would use them. Um, the one I was mentioning earlier is the Clinical Guide to Probiotic Products. Um, available in the U.S. It's online. It's an app. It's really, really a good database. Then this last piece is this stress piece. Stress is a huge part of gut health. Um, I really feel like you can have the best protocol in the world, but if you've not helped people or if they have not dressed either stress triggers in their life or coping with it, that you're going to have a much less of a positive response. The science is really solid behind that. I have complete confidence in saying that this is tied to gut health and it's something that you need to manage. So what, what you actually do then, right? Um, one is I like to consider what helps them. Um, the one of the classes we were teaching uh, that I teach is the deep dive class for chronic kidney disease. We have a whole gut health module. It's um, uh, it's quite what is it 12, 12 hours or so. It's a lot. We go into a lot of detail. But in that class, um, Jen Hernandez was there, and she's like, "I have patients. They say they watch TV eight hours a day. And it helps them relax. What do you like? Is that really a stress release?" And it was such a great question because. Sometimes how we perceive um, managing stress is not really managing stress. Really what we're doing is we're just trying to, um, to uh, stamp out or kind of press out or suppress emotions and not deal with things. So watching TV eight hours a day, does that help people manage stress? I don't know. Uh, my evaluation point to me, it, it wouldn't be, but my evaluation point would be when you get done with that activity, are you feeling uh, more empowered to cope with whatever you need to, or do you feel exactly the same? Because if you don't feel empowered by whatever the, you know, whatever the um, technique is for coping, it's probably not actually a stress management technique. And, you know, you want to consider different people gain stress management from different things. So some people that are very people oriented, going out and having lunch with a friend or whatever is really, really nice for them and helping cope with stress. Other people, that'd be the worst thing ever, going out with people stresses them out and they'd rather go meditate or read a book or be creative. So one, one size stress management technique does not fit everyone. The other thing is I really like to help people identify triggers 
or refer them out to someone, a therapist that can help them identify these triggers in their life, whether they're conscious or subconscious, of triggering this stress response and helping them learn either boundaries, being able to say no, or being able to um, find a balance with self-care and care of family members. You know, there's a lot of stresses. If they're in dialysis, dialysis itself is a stress. So how, how can they manage that better? How can they come to their treatments in the right frame of mind? Um, are we talking to people all the time about disease or are we talking to them about health? Because even how we frame our health journey is really important in how we're going to perceive it as stressful or healing. Um, it's hard to know though, which comes first here, the stress or the poor gut health or poor response to stress because of poor gut health. I don't know. So a couple unanswered questions. Is there more that we could do? Yes, I would say gut healing methods are poorly studied in people with CKD, ESRD, for sure. Which probiotics are best? A lot more research is ongoing here, and I think this is going to continue to be a really cool area in uh, healthcare. How long should people take kidney-specific probiotics, like Remedil versus others? You know, like how long do we take probiotics? How long, you know, when do we know that it's good enough? Um, uh, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of questions surrounding this. Um, we don't really know these gut healing herbal remedies. Usually if you're removing things, you use some herbal supplements. We don't know how they impact the gut specifically for people with kidney disease. I was at a conference in March. Lucky me, I slid in one last conference before COVID. And the, <clears throat> the researcher that presented on gut health, she mentioned that even introducing these kidney friendly bacteria that she says, you know, one of the byproducts as they consume uremic toxins is that they produce ammonia. And she's like, is that really good? She's like, and again, she was like, I don't know. Like we just know these things happen. And you know, is there value in maybe diversifying how we use probiotics? Could we address more of these Rs with people with kidney disease and get better results? Yes, I think so. Um, I think we could work this more into our therapy and I think it will become more um, as time goes on. Um, I've talked a little bit about some of these barriers and I'm gonna give credit to this slide for, you know, Lindsay and I work a lot on these things together and she came up with this slide, which I think is really, really great, um, you know, for dialysis patients. She's teaching a course for dialysis patients uh, next, or for dietitians new to dialysis next week. And this is something that we've talked about, you know, if you're gonna do a five hour program, what are the barriers? One is not everyone on the healthcare team's on board. Two, financial resources can be a big deal what is the, the time frame um, and diagnosing is challenging. People don't always want to pay for the functional test, you know, 200 to $400 to, to work on those. And even in that case, they don't always know how to interpret them. Um, I know for myself, I uh, probably for every person I test, I work with a higher level practitioner to interpret the test and understand it on a deeper level. And that's part of my learning and growth area. So these last few slides are just resources. Um, I definitely can open the training up or open this up for questions at this point. If some people have some questions that I can answer about a five R protocol and applying it. These last few things, I just, I think there's a ton of great resources out there. If you're wanting to dive into this, understand the gut better and how to apply it in your practice. Um, so Megan, I'll, I'll kind of open that up. Yeah, thanks. Okay, we have so many questions. We'll try to get to them, um, but you know, anything we don't answer, we'll try to formulate an answer and send it out after. Um, Jessiana, we had a lot of moms who could relate to your work, home office struggles. So sorry. Yeah, no, I was like, no, no everyone. <laughs> there's a lot of people being like, we understand. So you're not alone Thank there. You. I appreciate it. Um, all right, so I'll just dive right in. So the first question we had was, what if any are the implications for patients who have had renal CA and only have one functioning kidney? Ooh, that's a good question. So what are the implications for renal, um, renal cancer? You have one functioning kidney. So you can live your whole life with one kidney. My dad has had one kidney his whole life. He got knocked out you know, when he was 17 as a football player. 
um, and he seems to be doing great. So I feel like with any of, you know, kidney disease in general, um, you're still going to be watching the function to determine your intervention. For someone that has had a history of cancer, though, I, I still would want to get a, you know, like a more global picture of what, you know, like their full health status. Um, and again, it goes back to, um, it goes back to what symptoms are they manifesting? I don't know all the research with cancer and the gut. I'm sure it's tied in somehow because basically everything in healthcare now is tying back to the gut. But um, yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure. I'll just say on the kidney disease side, unless they're starting to see decline, you don't necessarily need to nourish the one kidney any more than if you had to. Okay. Um, these are kind of, I'm kind of combining a few things here, but um, can you explain exactly what you mean by bacterial overgrowth and what is the gold standard of testing for SIBO? Wow, this is a long, a long topic. I actually pulled out all my SIBO slides. We go <laughs> through it in the uh, deep dive. We have about six slides that talk about SIBO. Um, I think that is a longer question than I want to answer here. Here is what I do for SIBO right now is I refer it out because it quite honestly scares the pants off of me. So there's a couple great dietitians that are fantastic with SIBO and I refer to them or I kind of guide people through what they would need to do when they're talking with a doctor. I do not treat SIBO because like I said, it is a, it's a whole other ball game. It's, it's a totally different gut health issue. Um, and then bacterial overgrowth is when you start getting more bacteria in your small bowel than should be there or even uh, you know almost any in that small bowel area and it's going it's going to create uh, you know a lot of very unpleasant uh, symptoms that that first part of the small intestine it's a it should be a fairly acidic environment more or less um, with the chyme dropping in there you know because you're helping knock out some bacteria and if it's not if you have low stomach acid and the chyme that's dropping in there is not very acidic you can get some pretty nasty overgrowth um, so it's good okay um next one is is bone broth an issue for those with gout because it's high in purines Ooh, that's a good question too um, so when I'm dealing with gout and purines and all of that history, I'm looking again at the whole picture. Um, it potentially could be an issue for them, but I would, you know, like I said, it doesn't have to be a first line therapy. I don't use it for my CKD patients. Uh, I don't know if I would use it for a gout patient. I tend to always err on the side of caution with gout because it is so incredibly painful. Um, uh, but yeah, I don't know if I'd use it as a first line therapy, but with gout, I'm looking at a lot of other things and maybe they would have enough room for the purine mode of a bone broth. I don't know, it would kind of depend on the patient. Okay. Um, do you have any specific recommendations for patients that have had GI surgeries? Um, yeah, again, it's kind of what GI surgery and you're going back to understanding your anatomy and physiology of the gut. It's also for me on any surgery, people get proactively put on a probiotic and I'm kind of, you know, in that case, I'm like, well, uh, or not, they're not put on probiotic, they're put on an antibiotic. It should be a probiotic too. And so I'm kind of thinking, you know, if we've knocked out all the bacteria in your gut, we probably need to be replenishing and considering that piece. For each of the GI surgeries, depending on what's taken out and what enzymes are coming through there or you know, what was impacted, we also absorb different nutrients at different, different times. Um, so yeah, that's a good question. All right. Um, we have someone asking, what's the research for probiotic use? AGA does not recommend per this week's release. I don't know if you've seen that release. Oh man, I saw it. And I'll tell you exactly what I told my husband. I said, I do not agree. I, I, that's what I said. So um, here is why I do not agree with that release. What they said is that there was not enough evidence to recommend, I should pull it up so I can get the exact wording. I was kind of really irritated by it. Um, there's not enough evidence to recommend the usage of probiotics. And, and then more or less, I can't remember the last part, it's more or less, it's a, it's a cost that people don't need to be putting money in. Here's the thing about this, and this is the other part of the presentation I did not put in here, and 
if any of you guys want like the best presentation in the world, have Lindsay Zerker come talk to you about evidence-based medicine, is that how they define evidence, uh, I don't know how they defined the evidence here. Was it they were looking at double blind placebo controlled gold standard studies or, or what? Because I can say, and again, anecdotally from in practice that they're really important. And if you look at the research of how probiotics are playing into different diseases and the outcomes from those, I think that there is a compelling reason to try them and to put a blatant recommendation of like, don't, like, don't use them. I don't feel like that's fair for patients that maybe want to try an intervention that may help. And I think that the GI world kind of, uh, uh, I gotta get off my soapbox here. The GI world, I think, does not always service people the best way. They do a lot of diagnostics, but they don't always treat root cause. Not everyone, but that's been my experience. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, um, just can you clarify when you when you say glyphosate, do you mean Roundup? Yeah, Roundup is where you typically hear about it, um, but glyphosates are used in a lot of pesticides. Okay. All right. When recommending a trial period for patients in the repair step, how long do you typically recommend patients try out certain foods and supplements before ruling it out, trying something new, or continuing? That's a good, that's a really excellent question. Again, it's going to depend a little bit what we're targeting um, and kind of the long, um, the long run, the long range plan for someone. So for example, if it's uh, bloating and we're going to try a digestive enzyme, they should notice a difference within like a week. If I think their stomach acid is low and we're going to add in some betaine HCL and we're going to see if that makes a difference, uh, then again, like um, they should notice that pretty rapidly, like within a week. On a total overall, if we're just repairing the gut, again, that's where you can't just focus on one step. Overall, I'm looking at a full symptom management. I'll, I'll use a symptom survey for my patients where we have a lot of symptoms and they have a numerical number. And then every two weeks as we walk through therapy, we redo that symptom survey. And then I can see what's going up or down or you know that sort of thing with symptoms. And then I can look at the full overall plan. Any gut protocol that's taking you, uh, especially if you have testing that's taking you longer than four months, probably you need, I mean, within like six to eight weeks, you should be noticing a difference. And if you're not, you need to go back and uh, reassess your plan and make sure you haven't missed anything. Great. Um, okay, we just have two more. Uh, sure. Thoughts on Anchor and Week products? Uh, okay, this is funny. I just, I literally just bought a bag of this um, to try out because my husband really wants to reintroduce gluten in his diet. I'll just tell you guys, gluten-free bread, I know you can, you have to toast it. If you guys ever have people go gluten-free, you must tell them to toast the bread because eating untoasted bread is like even a kitchen sponge. But the, uh, the Icorn wheat products, again, it kind of goes back to that glyphosate. Um, for me, that's why I purchased it and was incorporating this as far as including gluten because I tend to not, um, I, I tend to not, uh, I tend to tolerate fine wheat products that don't have that. I don't know like the full science on the GMO and the, uh, on the icorn products. Um, I have some flour. It made great pancakes for us the other day, but like, I don't, I don't know the rest of the science behind icorn, but I'll just say on the glyphosate piece, that's why I as a consumer purchased it. Um, All right. Um, okay. And then how would you know when not to recommend a probiotic or when to stop a probiotic if a patient has SIBO? Um, well, so again, SIBO, if people, have, if people have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, they're gonna have really significant, or they should have persistent, maybe is a better way to say it, very persistent gut symptoms, diarrhea or constipation, definitely bloating. Um, so those are, in those cases, depending on how long it's been, they've had that condition, I just want to know their response. The problem without testing here is that <clears throat> sometimes when you introduce a probiotic, it starts killing bad bacteria and you'll have an uptick in your symptoms. 
because you have die off from these uh, bad bacteria. And on the other hand, if you introduce a probiotic and people feel really worse, especially extra bloating, then I'm like, oh, you might have SIBO. Let's pull that back and see if you feel better. The other, the other thing is if you introduce a probiotic too fast and you give like a mega dose, it doesn't matter what's going on in your gut, you're gonna feel kind of cruddy. So if people have gut symptoms, you might ease them into a probiotic starting with 5 billion to start and then slowly ramping it up. Some of the heavy duty products have upwards of 300 billion plus uh, organisms in them. So starting at 5 billion is usually a pretty reasonable starting spot. Okay, and I just, this is the last one. It's just, I think it's a good question. Um, what would be a good bile acid supplement for someone whose gallbladder has been removed and is experiencing GI problems? Uh, ox bile is one that people will use. I use designs for health products. Um, there's a lot of them out there, but you're, you're basically, you know, ox bile, I think is probably the most common bile acid supplement. I can't remember off the top of my head what the other one is. There's another one that you can use, but I, I have used just ox bile in and of itself, uh, with a couple of clients. Okay. It's, and I'll tell you the response is like, Ugh, like, what is this? You know, but I don't know if they feel better. They're usually motivated to take it. <laughs> All right. Well, Jessiana, thank you so much. This was such a great presentation. Um, we very much appreciate your expertise and everyone, thank you for your excellent questions and participation. Um, afterwards, we will be um, posting this recording on the Dr. Shar Institute if you want to watch it later or share it with friends. And um, we will be sharing some handouts. So feel free, well, be on the lookout for an email from me, but also feel free to browse on the Dr. Shar Institute or reach out to Jessiana if you have questions, her website and, you know, all her social media at KidneyRD. Um, and I just have this up here so you guys can talk about Flavus. I appreciated your little shout out there about um, a glyphosate and the wheat quality, um, but you know we do have Flavus foods for CKD patients. They're low protein, sodium, phosphorus, and potassium, and high in fiber. So we're trying to meet the wide variety of needs for CKD patients, and they're really helpful tools for how, helping people follow this really complicated diet. So um, you can find out more at Flavus.com. Cool. And the pizza crust is my favorite. I was really <laughs> sad when we ran out of our sample boxes because it was like. Such a snap to put dinner together for my <laughs> husband, and now we have to buy the expensive gluten-free pizzas at the store, and I don't want to make cauliflower crust. <laughs> I'll have to send you some. <laughs> Pizza crust is really good. Oh, so. thank you. All right, and that's it. Um, have a good day, everyone. Okay, thanks so much, y'all.